This episode of The Ride is brought to you by Farnham. Admit it, bugs suck. They're the last thing you want hanging around your horse in the stable. Our friends at Farnham can help rid your barn of these annoying, filthy, disease-carrying bad guys. If you're ready for the best way to protect your horse, your stable, and yourself, look to Farnham's no-fly zone solution. The people over at Farnham have discovered the best way to set yourself up for success is by fighting on all fronts. With their three-stage approach of block, repel, reduce, you can be sure flies, mosquitoes, and ticks are kept away. Go to Farnham.com, that's F-A-R-N-A-M.com, to learn more and download a free copy of the Horse Owner's Guide to Creating Your Own No-Fly Zone. Plus, you can find money-saving offers to help get you on your way to a fly-free zone. Farnham, your partner in fly control. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of The Ride. This is Nicole. I'm here with my co-host Jillian and today we have a very special guest, Brad Kearns, who is very special to me because I've known him for more than half of my life. He is a big part of the reason why I got into the showing, horse showing industry to begin with and, and kind of end up in this position. But Brad these days is now the Western coach for Southern Methodist University. This is a new title for him after years of coaching world champion, Congress champion, quarter horse high point champion riders. He stepped away from that industry to kind of venture into a new industry, becoming the coach, the Western coach at SMU. So thanks, Brad, for coming on. This is truly a treat for me. Thanks for having me. So excited to to get to talk to you guys. So before we kind of go into what you're currently doing, for our listeners who might not be as familiar with your background as I am, can you kind of explain your your kind of horse life and how you even got started in the horse industry and, and kind of grew your passion and, and want to be in this industry all the time? Okay, well, you know me, so we're either going to go for the long version or the very long version. So, you know, like I, I started out, we got a pony, my my parents got us a pony because one of my friends got a pony and he was allergic to it. So we got it. And I, I was a big nerd. So I read a lot of books. And so I always loved horses. And then we got this pony and we were, you know, very novice. We had him chained in the front yard. He was on a chain that was a stake and he should have killed us many times because he was a stallion and we didn't know the difference. So we didn't know we had this stud pony and luckily he only walked around with an eight grass. And so then, you know, we graduated from the pony to a horse that my dad's friend, they had their son showed and some, and, and then it just kind of, you know, kind of kept rolling. We joined 4-H, me and my sisters joined 4-H, I have two sisters, Beth and Mary, and, and then we just kept going and we started showing at open shows. There was a saddle club about a couple miles from our house and, you know, we rode, we rode the horse to the saddle club and rode in the arena at the saddle club. And then we started showing, took lessons from some different people. And then we were, you know, taking lessons. We hauled to some people we knew in 4-H. So they get, had the trainer, court horse trainer come in and give lessons. And they, the, the wife, her name was Jeannie Corrington and she's Jean Anthony now. She lives in Florida and she told my dad, she said, you're, son has outgrown his horse and we bought a horse from an Arabian farm that was three years old and or four years old just turned four years old and had like 90 days riding and some some other friends said you should take it to the corridor show and we were you know, like, oh no, that's that's not for us. We're 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 not good enough for that. We're you know we're we we go to the open shows and the four A shows, and by chance, the place we bought the horse had a quarter horse show that that spring, and they said, why don't you just haul up and you can stay here for free? And we I showed and I won the Youth Western Pleasure every day. At, and out of like 25 people and, you know, with my white slick chaps and my plaid shirt with white piping and my feather hat band and it just kept going. I mean, I just kept showing and my sisters 
my middle sister showed some, my younger sister did not. And, you know, my parents got into trail riding and stuff and never really showed my, my, I will tell you that one of my favorite childhood memories is we were at a, at a, at a show on Mother's Day and they had a Mother's Day walk trot. And my mother was a teacher and one of her students that she had taught was showing there and she was, you know, older. She had her own daughter then and she asked my my mother, said, why don't you show with this? And my mother said, no, no, showing's not for me. I, I just trail ride and, you know, I come for the kids. And the other lady said, her name was Debbie, and she goes, she says, well, you're just a chicken blank. And she walked away and my mother turned around and she looked at me and my sister, and my dad, and she said, do you think we can get me in those chaps? And she showed in the in the walk trot, the Mother's Day walk trot at the show with 20 some entries and she won. And her former student came over and said, oh, Ms. Kearns, I guess you're going to start showing now. And my mother said, why? I'm retiring undefeated. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where it all started and it just kept building from there. I went to college and I still worked on the weekends and in the summers for some horse trainers and, and well, I actually was an amateur to start with. And then a trainer said, I, I really need you to help me and, you know, be assistant trainer. And I was like, Oh, sure. And that was Troy Oakley. And, and uh, so I gave up my amateur card and then worked for him and that kind of, when I got out of college, instead of going to graduate school, I told my parents I was going to take a year off and train, and then I'm going to take another year off and train. And then the third year, I told my parents, I said, I'm going to, would you think it was crazy if I became a full-time horse trainer? And my mother looked at me and looked at my dad, and she said, well, honey, if you love what you do, it won't feel like work. And, you know, at the time I'm like, oh, blessing. They're giving me the blessing. Now, years later, I'm like, hey, maybe you should have just slapped me and said snap out of it. But at the time I was I was like, really, I guess they're about they're behind me. They're they're supporting me. And, and you know, and it's been a great life. I mean, it's been a great life. I've had great friends. I, I have lots of former customers like Nicole that are still my friends and it, it's it's done and it all led me here it all led me here i think even if your parents said don't become a horse trainer you would have gone and become a horse trainer anyway it was it was your destiny it was your path probably probably i mean i but but that's i mean i will say i did absolutely hit the jackpot in the parent in the parent department i mean they are you know, they've been married 60 some years and, you know, I talk to them a lot and um, still ask their advice on everything. And they are they're just they're just great, great people. And, you know, if, if I probably would have said that I wanted to be a nail tech or something, they probably would have said, you know, been supportive, you know. But, but yeah, it did. It did. It did work out well. The horse industry is such a small world. I'm from Florida and I showed IHSA in college. So I know Jean very well from she coaches for FSU. So just such a small world. <laughs> but so anyway, how did you kind of transfer from the training career to being a coach at a college? Was that ever something that, you know, you saw in your career or kind of how did that unfold? So I'm going to jump back real quick and just I'm big. Tell a lot of stories. Nicole can tell you that. So Several years, not several years ago, but I, I've given a couple of those, well, several of those um, ride the pattern clinics at the youth world and at the regular world, amateur world show. And I was, I gave one for the horsemanship, I'm pretty sure. And after the, the ride the pattern clinic, Jeannie came up to me and she said, she said, do you know who I am? And I'm like, of course I know who you are. And, you know, and I hugged her and it was just so like homecoming because here is this, you know, lady who kind of like had faith in me, started me on my, you know, was, was part of the start of my path. 
And she was, you know, there watching me do something and was so like complimentary and everything that it really, I was very humbled that, that someone that I respected was complimentary of, of me. And I, I just really appreciated that. And, but, but back, back to your question. So the, the transition, I mean, realistically what I did for Nicole and her sister, Jesse and other people, the coaching is, is a, is a big part of what I do. And so it's, it's, you know, I'm used to have, having lots of students and going to the horse show and schooling the patterns and et cetera. So the, and, and one of my good friends who also transitioned over here said, said the, the, the coaching part, the barn part will be the easiest part of the transition. And, and it's true because, you know, it, it's so easy. And the girls here, I will tell you that the girls here at SMU, and I'm sure this is across the board with the other schools, but, you know, they're just fantastic. I mean, they, somebody asked me what was my favorite part of SMU. And I said, the team. The team is my favorite part of SMU because all of the girls, English and Western, are so just kind and, you know, we all share a common bond of love for the horse. So it's just wonderful. But the I'm, I'm getting a little sidetracked, but the transition to the, that part was very easy. And the way we practice here makes it very easy because we have somewhat of a smaller team and we schedule our practices where there's usually not more than three people practicing at a time. And they practice for about an, an hour is about the horse time. They have a little prep before and, and a little put away after, but, but it's so, it's really works well with like three people practicing. We, we, you know, practice patterns. We practice, we work on the horses. We work on, you know, a strength and stuff, but that piece is really great. And the girls, you know, it's really, it's really nice because the girls, you know, even when they're not starting, they're still, they're still getting to practice. They're still, building for their horse show experience outside of here because most of you stay showing if you love the horse you love the horse you know it doesn't it, it doesn't go away you might go on a diet for a little bit like nicole did when, when when she had to get a job and all that but you know come back you come back but the, the hard part transitioning was the you know the paperwork because you know we record so much and it's just a different, a, a different, you know, uh, set of going from being your own boss and, you know, like at the end of the month, sitting down and, and just like taking a, a half a day or a day and being like, okay, well, or, or in my case, maybe at the end of six months doing your, doing your paperwork. Now you are on more of a schedule. You know, you have deadlines and, and then you have meetings and, which are really great because we, we, in, when, in athletic meetings and stuff, we have speakers and, you know, there's just so much more. There's, there's, there's also just so many more sides to it of, of learning and meeting new people. And I don't know if that's a, an, an adequate answer to your question, but kind of like it's, it's not been a super hard transition, mostly because my head coach and the jumping seat coach are both Carol Gwynn's the head coach and Laura Persons is the jumping seat coach. And they're just both extraordinary people and they've really made it easy. I think something that we did not bring up is that your daughter, Naya, was actually at SMU before you got there. And that's a really special experience. Not many people get to have is, is being there and being part of her college career as, as well as her youth career. She won several world titles, Congress titles. I mean, she's done it all. What's that been like having Naya there and, and having your daughter there too? Well, it's, it's for sure has its own sets of challenges, but uh, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was, one of the strong selling parts of coming here. I mean, I wasn't really, I, I did think, you know, a couple of my friends had, had transitioned to college schools and coaching and, you know, I thought, Oh, that's really cool. That's really interesting. And, and, you know, I think that that would be 
a fun new chapter at some point in my life. And it just so happened that this job opened up and, and Naya was like, dad, I think you should, you should try to get this job. You know, I think you should try to get this job. Like it's, you know, it's a, it's a great school, which we already, I already knew. And, and, you know, and then, you know, you could see me more often and, you know, the Dallas weather is fantastic versus Chicago winters. And, you know, so I really, you know, I really took that into consideration because Illinois is a long way from Dallas. So it, it, it was, you know, we, you know, like any other parent with their child away at college, you know, we, we missed her. But so, yeah, it's really great because the, the dynamic with with her and I is the same but different, and I mean we're we're the same because I'm coaching her and and things like that. But at the same time, it's like you know we really have to make make sure that I am 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 coach and then dad away from school, which you know sometimes is is work for me. It's not really work for her, but it's work it's work it's work for me because you know we we want to coddle and pet a petter and say it's okay or you know this or that you know it was uh, and and it's i have to be brutally honest which most of the time i am honest but you know it, there there's no there's there's no like okay i can you can cry and i'll hug you or whatever it's it's you know there's a little more lime in the dirt of of where, where coach and dad are. So it's great. And you know, like all the girls on the team are like my daughters at this point. I mean, they're, I mean, Nicole, you know, I mean, like I love all my kids. I mean, just they're, they're all so great for so many different reasons for their own personalities. I mean, we just had senior day and I promise you, I, I cried when every single senior, you know, of the Western team came up, you know, to get their flowers and, and things. And, you know, because I, I will really, really miss them. I mean, I hope that they stay active in our alumni, but, but it's, it's all, all of the girls are, are like my daughters now. Yeah, I can confirm. Brad literally let me live at his house in the RV, going to horse shows, taking me there, helping me with my homework when I homeschooled because Lord knows I was not interested in doing my homework. And Brad was like, you're going to do it or else you're not showing. So can confirm. <laughs> yeah, um, I have to tell a really, a really funny story on Nicole. And so when Nicole, when they first came to me, the Chiricos, she knows what I'm going to tell. So they had a horse that was a talented horse, but it also was a naughty horse. And they brought it up for, we called it an evaluation. And she rode it around and her mother was there and she's riding it around. And like she, you know, trots it around about, you know, a lap. And then it gets to the door and it like stands on its hind legs and walks across the arena. And then it's front feet hit the ground and she trots around again, like just like it had, you know, never happened. And then it does it again. And then I said, OK, I've seen enough. And her mother looks at me like with a head spin and she's like, don't you want to see a canter? And and I remember looking at her mother and saying, "Do you like your child?" I mean, I was I I I'm taking the horse. Her mother was afraid I was going to say, "No way are we taking the horse." And I was like, "This is a nice girl. She has a nice little sister. She has a nice parents." I'm like, "I am taking this this horse because I like these people, you know, Vicky was afraid I wouldn't take the horse because I didn't like the horse. And I'm like, we have to help these people. They are nice people. And, and the horse is talented. It just was like, you know, they'd been trying to do it on their own and it was just too much horse for a, a 13 year old girl to handle. 
Yeah, he was three, and I think I was like twelve. I don't even know if I was a teenager yet. It just it was a it was a tough fit. Needless to say, Brad found me a very good horse after that one, and uh, yeah, it kind of led to a, a very fun, different career that I never thought would happen. But anyway, kind of going back to. Well, kind of just you. I, I kind of want to go back to, to your history and your background before we kind of dive into the NCEA a little bit more. You've talked a little bit about some of the people you worked for. Can you kind of talk a little bit about some of the the different philosophies that have stood out to you over the years, with whether it's working with different trainers or, you know, things that you've just learned on your own? Are, are there any kind of philosophies that really stick with you over the years? Well, I think like I worked for Donnie Dickerson for nine and a half years and he's one of my best friends. And, you know, I'll never forget that, you know, one time him coming out of the barn and I was riding some knucklehead and he said, get off and put that horse away. I don't want to see you ride it anymore. And he, he bought and sold a lot of horses. And, and I said, well, you know, like we, I, I have to ride it. That's part of my job. And he said, you're not going to teach that one anything like it's 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 not willing to learn. And we have you have to learn like it has X amount of talent and X amount of try. And you're not going to get more than that. So when when you've hit the limit, all you're doing is frustrating yourself and the horse. And, and I think that that was a really a, a really good lesson for me that, that, you know, just like I'm never going to play, was never going to play NBA ball. Some horses will never make it to the show pen and that's okay. They can still have a job and they can still be somebody's pet, but not every horse can be a show horse. And you can't, if you try to make it to them, it's just going to not going to work and it's going to frustrate them and frustrate you. And so find a job that find a job that they're capable of and find, let them be successful. Other philosophies. Oh gosh, I don't know. There's probably so many that I should know. Probably one of my favorite things that I've ever learned. I worked for Alex Ross and when I wanted to become a judge, I remember him telling me this is, and I still tell this to this day, like he told me that my placings and my scorecard should tell the story of the class. So, you know, you should be able to look at the placings and you should be able to look at the scorecard and it should tell you the story of how the class went. And I really think that was good verbiage as to, you know, like when you're looking at the when you're going to judge, judge something that, you know, it's it's really about what's happening and how do you how do you convert that into a placings and along that same lines uh, diane and i were talking in alan mitchell's and we talked about and i think dave Dillon was in on it too and we talked about that you know so much of judging and horse show involvement even from the spectator point of view is from the negative you know we we look at a horse and we go oh i don't like the way it jogs or i don't like the way it does this or i don't like this and we don't look at it and go okay it's it's you know we don't evaluate that it's good or very good or excellent or average you know we just immediately go to our, ver our thought process of i don't like this i don't like that rather than i like this i like that it has a good top line i like that it has a two beat gate you know maybe it does has longer strided and that is going to hold it back but we we evaluate based on the negative rather than the positive so i tried to change my thought process because i think that we do that in all of life you know we look at a person and we immediately think about what we don't like or we we would want different rather than appreciate the positives that that person brings to the table and the horse the same way and our job the same way you know we, we don't focus on all the good things of our job you know like and, and then we start only only focusing on the negative. And I think that in the in the judging in horse training, 
in everything, you know, if we could just shift to the think, thinking of the good things. Also, sorry, side note, sometimes it's hard to get away from being the dad. I, I, get, I do a lot of dad speeches, so sorry. So I just want to say from an exhibitor's perspective, I love that philosophy because, you know, I feel like sometimes you go out there and it really is, you know, the judge is looking for the mistake, looking for what's wrong with the picture. And, and I love that you can kind of flip that and, and find the more positive of the situation. You've obviously worked with a ton of different horses throughout your career and ridden so many different horses. Do you have any that really stuck out to you and are still one of your, you know, your top favorites of all time? Oh, I, I knew this was going to be a question and it's such a terrible question because they're, they're, are so many. I mean, my list is is so long because I'm old, basically. But I mean, there's there's so many. My my youth horse was my favorite horse, one of my favorite horses because he started it all. And his name was Dandy Firecracker. He was born on July the fourth. His brother, his his. His parents were brother and sister, so that was kind of an accident, I'm sure. And, you know, like, we bought him. I was second at the World Show. I mean, we bought him for 3500 at an Arabian farm, and I was second at the Quarter Horse Youth World Show in the Western Pleasure. But And, and he was a fabulous horse. He went on to win the High Point of the Nation in the Amateur Pleasure after I had sold him, and he paid for my college. So got to gotta give him some props, you know, but, like, I mean, I had, of course, Zippo's Ace of Spades is one of my favorite of all time. He was two-time all-around at the Amateur World Show. He was all-around, of course, Amateur Select World Show, the same one of the same years he won the Amateur all-around at the World Show. You know, he was the first first horse that my daughter ever showed in the walk trot. You know, he won the high point in the nation in the all-around youth. I, I mean, I love that horse. I, Main Street Cruiser, who I won the world show on, and he won the world show twice in the youth for the girl that owned him, and her sister won the Congress on him, and he was a fun horse, a great, great horse. One that I really loved, loved was horse, oh, horse, oh, I had several that I worked for Donnie. We had Bar Passers Cody, who ended up being a multiple world champion after we sold him to, to Diane. We had a horse called Vinny Zuno, who was, Donnie and I bought him at the Dixie Nationals one year, and he just was a, a, a fabulous, fab, turned out to be a fabulous horse. And I mean, like one of the most natural lopers you'd ever ride in your life. It was a horse named Dynamic Fashion, who I loved. She won the Congress and she's been the mother of several famous horses that have won a lot. She lived at BSB in Michigan. That's where she finished out her brood years. Broodmare years. Gosh, I'm going to forget so many. Uh, Made Me Sleepy, who was a fabulous horse, won the Congress twice, taught me that persistence is key because he was not an easy horse, but he was a great horse. And his full brother, who was Sleepy Cloverdale, who ended up winning the all-around youth in the nation, that horse bucked me off at the Congress the day of the two-year-old snaffle bit. He bucked me off in the morning, and we had sold him to Diane Eppers. And... He bugged me off out on the track, and it was sunny morning, and I see this shadow as I'm laying in the dirt, holding the reins clenched in my hand, and I hear, are you okay? And it was Diane. And, of course, the, the person who sees me gets bucked off is the person who has bought the horse. And then I had we had a horse named Casey Me Now that was we did the pleasure on. And then it was the first horse I ever taught to do the Western riding. And he ended up winning the world show in the Western riding for, for an amateur after we had sold them. Gosh. And then that's all kind of prior. Well, two of them are from when I was in Illinois. And then in Illinois, I mean, we just had... So many, so many great ones. I mean, the Cherico girls had great ones, Blazing Covers and Potential Melody. And also, she's a Zip Tease, which was Nicole's first quarter horse show horse. They were great ones. I mean, we've had the perfect crime. I, Nicole bought that horse as a two year old. And thank you, Wayne Davis and Becky Bailey, for all you guys letting that happen. It was a phenomenal horse. Has won so much, and 
was just a, the funnest horse ever and is still going and is fabulous. I know I'm forgetting a lot. And then, I mean, of course, I had two for my daughter, Never Sudden, who I bought. Julie Vogie helped me buy him. And Naya won the Youth World in the Horsemanship on him and was reserved in the Western Riding and had, I mean, just like the most personality, the most athletic and talented and beautiful animal you've ever seen. And he's, I mean, he's still doing well. Eric and is showing him and he's kicking butt with him and the amateur, but just like the, the funnest, most personable horse ever. And then, I mean, I would be certainly remiss if I didn't miss Merlin. I won't cry, I promise. BMQ stop for traffic. The most <laughs> bad name ever. And he is like, he's won the World Show four times in the equitation. He is just like, we use him here for the team. I mean, he is a, a, just a, a fabulous horse. And thank you, Rick Klaus, for letting me buy that horse. He is a gentle giant. And he's, you know, we don't know if he's really smart or really not very smart because he is kind of like Clifford, the big red dog. I mean, he just is all over the place walking and, you know, but, and he's, you know, doesn't have a big motor and, but he's still probably the only 18 year old that you have to lunge before you ride. I mean, but he is, I mean, he's super talented and, you know, like, I mean, Naya would never sell him in a million years. I mean, he's, forever home and if I even I mentioned it one time and she was like I'll get a job I'll I'll pay his bills whatever you know so that one you know that one for sure has a, has a special place because you know we still have him and we'll never part with him so it's pretty wild to you know you saying all these names and, and throughout the year some of them are still current in the industry some are from you know a while back you've had you know you've been around all these amazing amazing animals throughout your career and it's just um, it's just, you know outstanding to see I, I obviously I knew that you've been around a lot of really great horses I was I was in that barn and I saw a lot of really great horses but there's so many more that I didn't know about and, and I can't like I, I really have to shout out to what about Bob Murray yes. uh, Ed Murray and he lives then he um, was Jonna Letchworth's horse and he lives with Jonna and and he was also a super super special horse but sorry i didn't mean to interrupt nicole but i just didn't want i didn't want to forget forget murray in 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 that list no i get it murray is also probably one of my favorite horses that i ever got to watch he's just so fun you mentioned that merlin is is with you guys on the team are you guys using him for horsemanship competitions yes and he's he's doing well um actually a little too well because he won the point for hanno lawson this past weekend for, for Texas A&M. So, but he, he's, he's doing well. And like when we, when I showed him at the world show in November, she showed the, uh, the amateur equitation was on Wednesday night. I think it was. And he went in on the meet on Saturday, you know, so, but he, you know, we, we are using him and, and he loves it. He loves the girls. And, you know, I think it's keeping him young. I mean, if you saw him out, he does not look 18 years old and I mean, he's still a great horse, great moves, great. And, and I think it's giving him a job and keeping him young. So with the other horses that you use, are those ones that you've worked with in the past or where, where do you get the horses that you use with the team from? Well, a lot of them are donated. Some of them are leased. We do have one on the, the team right now that we use in the horsemanship that was actually I owned it and then one of my youth kids bought it and was seventh at the world show on it. Her name is Lydia Brailer and the horse's name is Rita and she's a fabulous horse and they leased her to us for the year. All the girls love her. She is a very special horse. She's very sweet and she's very talented. And then we have another horse that Claire Robertson owns, a Rainer, that we also have le leased for the year. I mean, it's great for the girls because they get to see their horse and be around their horse and, and, you know, 
And then also, like, they get to share their horse with their friends. And then I think we have a couple on the English side also that are leased. But a lot of them are donated, like, either from other people, like the Ropers have donated a couple of Rainers, Tim and Linda Roper, and some of I mean, they're fabulous horses. We have a horsemanship horse on the horsemanship side that one of the Western girls donated to the program. And then... We, we just got an amazing horse named Austin that was donated this year, who is just, I mean, he's just perfect. I mean, I, I mean, he has great personality. He loves treats. He's like the best lead changer you'd ever want to sit on. He turns around good. He's dependable. He's sweet, doesn't cheat. And I mean, like, you know, I mean, we, we, we get most of the horses are, are donated, but then some some are on leases. And sorry, I went through a long, a long explanation there, but it's it's a little bit of mix of both. Now, from the the riding side of things, I mean, I, I did the NCEA, which was then NCAA back when it kind of first started. But I feel like it's evolved since then. And, and there's, you know, these girls kind of know what they're getting into before they, they join a team. What is your advice to somebody that's looking to join a team? How did they become successful, you know, reaching out to coaches or, or what is, what is kind of your advice to somebody who wants to, to get involved? I think that, that, you know, that there's several different avenues for them to go. I mean, obviously we are, you know, watching at the big shows, we're attend those larger events to watch them and watch the people that show, you know, on a larger scale compete. But we also, you know, do see go to some of the not as large shows and, and watch and observe. But then we get a huge amount of people that video send us videos, you know, videos. And what's really important, I think, when you're sending video submissions to coaches for you to know is that it doesn't have to be show perfect. It doesn't have to be completely show attire, all cleaned up, you know, and and show perfect because you're going to be riding a strange horse in college that that you don't know. So, how you handle those imperfect opportunities that come up with the horse is part of what we're looking for. You know, like it it is not necessarily about being able to have that. Oh, I'm going to edit it till it's perfect. I'm going to do it a thousand times till it's perfect. You know, sometimes it's nice to see the imperfection so that, so that the coaches can, evaluate how well you handle the imperfections. I mean, Nicole knows, you know, like, I mean, our saying in our barn is is the person who wins is the person who has the best plan B because your plan A never goes into effect. I mean, it never stays true first from start to finish. So you have to have the best plan B. Like, you know, my horse, you know, dove in a little bit there. So that's going to make my circle off. So I'm going to have to change my circle a little bit size wise to accommodate where my horse just cheated me a little bit, you know? So, you know, from, from that point of view, like seeing that you can handle those things that happen are, are really, really important and, and reach out to the coaches, reach out to the coaches of the schools that you are really like and reach out to the coaches of the schools who are maybe just maybes because you know until you actually see a school in person like we all know you know things look different on paper than they look in person so you know your top choice might not be your top choice after you see something in person so reach out through email through calling and and just know like we already have people that are freshmen reaching out to us. We cannot communicate with anyone who is a freshman or sophomore until June 15th of their sophomore year at the end of their sophomore year. So understand that we're not going to be reaching back out to you. We might, you know, send you an email that says, you know, thank you. Sorry. We can't communicate with you until this time, but you know, Get your get your name in the pot. Get your name in the pot and and get some recognition for them knowing you. You don't necessarily have to be 
winning at the large show to be recruited. You have to be desirable in that you can ride things when they go wrong and you have, you know, a good work ethic and good sportsmanship and, and respect for the animal. Like I know, like if I'm at the horse show and I'm recruiting, or even if I'm not recruiting, if I'm just watching or I'm there showing and I see some person come out and they, you know, made a mistake or the horse made a mistake, but they immediately start being, you know, rough on the horse and taking their emotion out on the horse then, you know, for me, that's not necessarily somebody who I'm going to maybe think either I want to train my horse. I don't want to recruit that person. I don't want, you know, like I don't want to learn something from them. I mean, so all those things that you do come into play because it it's a team. It become, it go, you go from being, as Nicole knows, you, you go from becoming fly sport into a team atmosphere and, you know, your your teammate has to know that you respect them and you're supporting them and you have to know that they're you're respect them and supporting them. And, and so so many of the things that you do around the horse show that we might observe and will be, will come into play as to whether you're desirable for for a coach, because, you know, just because you can win doesn't mean that you'll be successful on in this format or that you're successful in the team atmosphere. So, so you have to be desirable on all fronts to a coach. I can only imagine how much the sportsmanship and the attitude has to do with it. I mean, like you said, it's a team, which I feel like some girls might struggle with coming from the individual sport of it but so when you are recruiting riders you know once you find ones that you are interested in do you have them come ride for you and get to know them better or how does that work once you you know found that you're interested in someone well we 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 can't really have them we can't really have them ride for us and evaluate them there are some options though because you know in addition to the videoing and we see them at the horse shows twice a year. Most, most all of the schools have camps and at these camps, the, they can attend the camp. And when they come to the camp, it really gives them a college experience a little bit because we do tour campus and we talk about admissions and we talk about that. You have to have good grades. You know, we tour the barn. We, we, you know, ride, we, we do at the camp, they can ride and they will ride and get a feel for riding different horses. They'll ride different horses during the day at the camp. And then we also will practice for a scrimmage because the second day of the camp will have a scrimmage and they will, you know, teams will go against each other. And so it gives them, it gives them a chance to see you know, because they get to see the horses warm up and then they also get to see like do the draw, we do the four minute warm ups and it's, and we, I, I try to put them on a different horse than they've ridden in the, in the other parts of the camp. So they really get that four minute warm up, you warm up, you try to figure out where the tricks are of the horse. And then you got to go do the, do your pattern and you got to do it against another person. So it really gives them an, an idea. And it also gives an idea to us, you know, like, this, this person is is coming to camp and they can, you know, if they have a good attitude and if they're friendly with the other people at camp and if they're respectful of the horses and and, you know, so forth. And, and then also, you know, they, they will ride and compete in the in the scrimmage. And but I mean, it really I mean, a lot of a lot of of. Uh, camp shows us how how they their work ethic is and how respectful they are of others and of the horses i mean i'm a big horse welfare person i really want my horses to be respectful respected and brushed and you know taken care of and and you know you know watered and fed and you know all those kind of things and 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 
And so I really, it really gives me a chance to kind of see how they are with that. And then also, you know, the other things, times that we can see them are like we talked about for shows and, and, and when they send us, send us videos, I hope that answered your question. I don't know if that was the right answer or not. I think, I think we got a lot of information from that kind of fast forwarding, not so much the recruiting side of stuff, but when girls actually join the team, you know, catch riding is a huge part of this, of this sport, of this, you know, kind of layout. Girls are riding horses they've never been around before for four minutes after watching them in a warm up for how many minutes. What's been your advice for, you know, a lot of these girls, while they are, you know, they're very talented horse women and they have a lot of experience showing, some of them might not have experience catch riding, you know, as like a professional might catch ride a little more than a non pro would. What's been your advice for? Or the, the catch riding aspect to kind of help girls kind of get into the mindset of, you know, you have to ride the horse you have. Don't have these expectations of, of what you were showing before. This is, you know, this is a different horse, a different kind of layout, everything. Well, and I, I think that that is a, is a good question because, you know, we do try to get them on different horses in the practice environment here at the school you know so and we do have them swap around some you know sometimes the rainers will ride the horsemanship horses and the horsemanship girls will ride the rainers just to get a different feel for you know because some rainers some raining horses do the horsemanship at the different meets and sometimes you get a raining horse you know, that is not a reigning horse for the, for the reigning at the meets because, you know, they, you know, they're donated sometimes because they have issues. And, you know, if you have two or three break at once, you know, you could be a school that has to put a horsemanship horse in the reigning. So they have to be ready to adapt. I think that it's really important for the athletes to like really pay attention during the warm ups to the what you know what their particular horse that they ride that day is telling them and what the rider that's warming them up is telling them you know do they ride it with a lot of contact do they ride it with zero contract contact do they are they able to use a lot of pressure with their leg do they seem like that they are not using their leg very much because it it, you know, the horse doesn't like it, you know, like try to find in the warmups, those different triggers that are there for you, for that particular horse that you're riding that day. And then in your four minute warm up, you know, really in your four minute warm up, try to figure out the transitions, try to figure out, you know, how the breakdowns and the lope offs and the extended pieces, how that feels. Because it doesn't matter if you can run the fast circle Mach 7 and, and you've run 10 times faster than the other girl. You know, you have to be able to put the pieces together and you have to make it smooth. I, I like control. I like a plan. Nicole knows this. I like a plan. And I like it to be like, I mean, I always say, if you're a tad early, that's a plan. If you're late, you're a victim, you know? So I, I really think they have to try to figure out how they can put the, the it's kind of like Top Chef, you know, you're getting these different ingredients that this horse has to offer and you've really got to put it together to make it into something that people like. And so you really have to figure out what you can, what pieces you can use the most of and really show your best side off and that horse's best side off. And, and where those pieces that you need to play it safe, because, you know, like I, I like control. I like it smooth. I like it to look like you planned it, you know, like if, if, if you're running around there and you're the fastest one around the track, but your body is out of control and you don't look like the, the horse is controlled, that it's just going and, and you're not going to be able to get to the next maneuver, that is not going to be credit earning at least not for me. So 
find where you can excel, find where the horse can excel and, and make put together the best dance with that horse that you can put together for that day. I think you also have a lot to offer. You come from the horse trainer aspect, but you also come from the judging aspect. You're, you've been the guy sitting in those chairs in the arena watching what happens. And we all know, and it's been said time and time again, what the judge sees in the arena is different from what people see in the stands. And so that advice, not only is it coming from a coach trainer kind of perspective, it's also coming from that judge perspective because you've seen all of that happen. You know when a rider has a plan versus one that's getting left behind or, or whatever. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, like I, I really appreciate thoughtfulness. I mean, that's my favorite word of the day or whatever is thoughtfulness. You know, like I want to, I want to know that, that you put thought into what was going to happen and that, you know, you're, you're doing your best. I mean, I think horsemanship is showing me that you are showing that horse to the best of its ability. You know, like you're not taking it somewhere that it's not able to go, that you're not taking it somewhere into a land that it's never been before or a maneuver it's not never been before and expecting it to be fantastic. And the same thing that just goes over to the reigning also, you know, like not, not every horse can stop big or turn big, you know, and you know, you've got to know, like you've got to know, like I want to circle that horse where it's controlled and I'm doing, you know, and it looks pretty and I'm lengthening when I need to lengthen and, sh and, and coming back when I need to come back. But, but it all looks smooth and put, and put together. I'm showing the athleticism, but I'm not trying to take it to a place that it's not been and, and, and make it look ugly, you know, like it, it needs to look controlled and planned and, and thoughtful. So something that we've kind of talked about for some other content that, you know, I've been doing with you for horse and rider is that, you know, this kind of showing really sets the girls up for just a better perspective on life after college. You know, it really prepares them for the postgraduate life. Is that, could you explain that a little bit? Just because I think that, you know, that's something that is so true and I never really thought about that before, but how it really does prepare them for after they graduate and for the workforce. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, like it, it's so, it puts them in a team. I mean, we're going to, I'm going to do a little joke here. That's what I do. You know, like, like, I tell people like Naya and I do horses because we can't do sports. We're not, we're not athletic. So, you know, but a lot of these, a lot of these young women, they come in and they've done a sport that's individualized and, you know, it was on them and their horse. And that was all like, I mean, you know, that, that was who, who carried the success. And now they're put into a team situation, a team environment. And, I mean, they bring in a good work ethic. They bring in, you know, sportsmanship. They they bring those things in, but they've never had to apply them in a group setting per se. So so now, you know, they they come in and there are all these different personalities, all these different personalities, and they have to you know, share the work with someone who is, you know, good at this or good at that. And they have to learn to recognize who excels at what, you know, who sweeps the tack room better, you know, who, who rolls the leg wraps up and they're loose and gross and you can't get them on the horse and who rolls them up, you know, tight and they're really easy to put on the horse. You know, I mean, those are just, they, they learn to work together and find out who's good at jobs. And then they learn like this person has a big personality and this person is quiet and sits, sits over here and kind of observes and they, they learn how to, you know, work with the person who has a big personality and work with the person who is more quiet and shy and comfortable over here, you know, observing and put it all together so that when they go out into the workplace, you know, they can be successful and work with any kind, any kind of people 
that they come into contact with. I, I used to, Nicole knows this, I used to have this little joke in my house, you know, like I had a little walk trot girl one time and, and, you know, I asked her a question and she, she said, yeah. And I said, excuse me. And she said, yeah. And I said, I'm sorry. Yeah. is not an appropriate answer. Like, yes, is acceptable. Yes, sir, is preferred. And if you're in her trouble, you should say, yes, your majesty. Because, because you know, and her mother said to me, you know, like, said, well, why, why do you think it's important for her to, to, to say yes or yes, sir? And I said, because when she goes out into the workforce, you know, that's part of my job, not only as a horse trainer, is, is to have them learn to be successful in the horse show world, but it's also to make them good people and well-rounded. And they'll go to a, they'll have a principal and a teacher and a coworker and a boss, and they'll have all these people that they have to deal with as they get older. And if they have good manners, it implies that they will be easy to work with because it just shows a little bit of respect and you know they'll go for a job interview and there'll be lots of people who are qualified lots of people who are you know smarter than them or more qualified or have more experience but if they can you know show that they have respect for others and then then they are desirable because that respect you know when i when you go into the workplace you know you guys know you you want that other person to i mean they don't have to be perfect with you know like you don't you don't want them to like you know think you're all that in a bag of chips but you want to be treated equally and you want you want to put out there that that you are willing you are showing them respect and you want to respect back. And I think that that is hireable. That is something that is hireable. That is something that makes the you you know in the job force you know excel because you know every person at, in in a company you know no matter what they do they they want to be respected. And, you know, that was something that I tried to teach Naya when she was young. You know, I was like, hey, what is your what is your janitor's name and what is your lunch lady's name? And, you know, and, and so forth. And she asked me, why is that important? I said, because every person at your school and every person in your company growing when you go to work, every person is important and what they do is important. And nobody is more important than the other person because if every person doesn't do their job, then every person is failing because the jobs aren't going to get done. So, you know, so I think it's really, really important when these girls come in that they learn to get along. I know, again, long answer. They get along with each other and they learn to respect each other and promote each other so that they can move forward and have a successful a successful team and then it will promote them to be successful in their life after the team when when they go out into the workforce and and just in general because you know another dad is 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 you know one of my favorite things to say is and it applies in in everything in order to be a blank in order to be a friend or to have a friend in order to have a friend you have to be a friend and in so you know, you, you have to learn to get along and then like you guys know you work together, you know, so, you know, you 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 have to have respect and work together and you learn that from somewhere. And so this 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 environment helps them to learn that. Totally agree. And some of the stuff that I learned when I was a kid at your barn, I still apply to this day. Many of things, actually, we don't have to list them all. But yeah, just, you know, making sure I'm always early. I, I'm never late to appointments because I, I learned that 5 a.m. did not mean get to the barn at 5 a.m. It meant be in the arena ready to go at 5 a.m. So that's, that kind of absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great, a great point. I mean, that is, that is something, you know, like, you know, on time is late. 
You know, I mean, that that's especially, you know, when you're and, and that's a Diane Eppers. We'll shout out to Diane Eppers. You know, on, on time is late because because, you know, like you, you can't be prepared if you're just walking in the door because other people are, other people know that on time is late. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on here and talking. I, we're hitting the hour 15 mark and I know you probably have girls that you've got to coach this afternoon and and you probably have lots to do outside of just talking to us, but I really appreciated it. I love talking to you. I'm so happy that we got to do this. I I loved it. I, I know that I'm long winded and I apologize for that. And I appreciate it, Jillian, for you asking me to do this and, and uh, Cheerio. I, I really am happy that, that you asked me to do this. I, you know, want to tell you, oh, God, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. But, you know, I'm just so proud of the woman that you've become. And, you know, I know I don't tell you that a lot. I I don't think that we really, as human beings, that we do tell people how much we appreciate them. So I, I do want to tell you how much I appreciate you and how proud of the woman that you have become and the person that you are. I mean, you were always a great person, but you know, you, you just, you just really make me proud. And, and so I'm very honored that you would ask me to do something like this with you. Yeah. Oh, you're going to make me cry. No, it was, it was so much fun. And, and like Jillian mentioned earlier, Brad is going to be, actually, I just got the magazine yesterday and you're going to be in our, spring issue where we talk about different riding teams. And then we also have another article coming up with you that I assigned through one of my freelancers late last year, but it's coming out in our bonus issue about pattern placement. And I, I just got done editing that one. And I'm so excited for that one. It kind of goes over a lot of what we talked about today with having a plan, being prepared, all that fun stuff. So we've got some, some fun stuff coming up the, uh, in the magazine with you, but is there anywhere where people can learn more about SMU and, and the Western team and everything with that. I know that SMU has some social media handles. and Yes, I mean, we have uh, an SMU Instagram. We have uh, SMU Equestrian, an SMU Equestrian Instagram, an SMU Equestrian Facebook page. You know, they also can, you know, Google us. Google is a great friend of mine and, and find out more about us. And then they're always welcome to call me. My phone number and my email are both on the SMU Equestrian page. And I mean, I'm willing to talk to anybody who wants to talk. And, and that's another thing, like real quick is, is if they are, you know, a sophomore or freshman or something and they called me, I, I mean, I, I, if they call me, I'm allowed to talk to them a little bit and not be rude, but I can, I cannot call them back. So just a point to know, I just like to people know, like we're not, coaches are not rude in general. We, we just have certain rules that we have to follow, but, but they can look up SMU and look at our Instagram or our Facebook and, or contact one of the coaches. And we're, the barn is three minutes from, or three miles from campus. So it's right here in Dallas. If they're ever in Dallas and they want to stop by and see the barn, tell them to reach out to me and I'll be glad to meet them here and show them the barn. I think it's also important to note that the, the events are open to the public too, right? I, I don't know with COVID policies. Absolutely. All the events at, at the different equestrian schools. I mean, I'm not 100% positive what the rules are for the other schools, um, but I do know that as a as a general rule, the equestrian competitions are open to the public. We love to have them out. Also, if anybody is interested, it gives them a chance to come out and see how it's run and, and see how the, the format works. So if they're interested in possibly riding for a school, they don't even have to go to the, you know, if you're from Texas, you know, you have choices because you have A&M and Baylor and TCU and SMU all in Texas. So if one of them is close to you, even if it's not your top pick school, you can go and see what the competitions are like. And that is, you know, the same for the other schools in other parts of the country. Even if that school is not your number one pick, you can go and, and look at, at and see how the format runs. You know, you might even like the school when you go there. Well, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure getting to talk with you today. Thanks, Jillian. It was great to meet you. You Good too. Good to see you, as always. 
Thank you guys for tuning in to the Ride Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow Horse and Rider Magazine on social media and find us at horseandrider.com. If you guys have any questions or comments, please be sure to hit us up at horseandrider at equinenetwork.com. We want to hear from you guys. And if you like what you're listening to, be sure to leave us a review on iTunes.